And it was a proof of concept course for us, but we could not have gotten better with the host, with the students. Uh, you said 517 Media was absolutely fantastic to work with. So even though this was just a proof of concept for our first course ever for actually teaching the advanced material, I just, I feel like it was a slam dunk all around and just everyone involved was so great to work with and hang out with. Welcome to Uncensored Tactical, where our goal is to talk about training, tactics, and more without being limited by red tape or a sterile bureaucratic environment so that we can bring you value and insight in a way that other organizations just plain can't. We are live. So I took that, um, the recording that me and you did with 517 Media uh, when we did our personal just two-person run-through for the audio. And it sounds really cool with just the raking and picking and footsteps and zippers. Um, so you won't hear it. The audience will have heard it already. Um, but that ASMR for covert entry will have been post posted. Just a little sample of it. Maybe we'll close the episode out with a long format of that. But welcome, Dave. So you have me, your host, Pat. And we have Dave here. Uh, the two of us taught our advanced covert entry course in Wilmington, North Carolina. Uh, we taught a two-day tactical lock picking course, which is a really solid foundation for non-destructive emergency entry. And we also do restraint escapes. That was on the 17th and 18th of August, 2022. Then the night of the 18th through the morning of the 21st, it was Thursday night, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday morning. We did three separate nighttime operations for covert entry along with uh, some key generation so how to pull information from a key or from a lock and to cut a key so that's where we've been there's been a little bit of lull in media for the instagram and the podcast um, but we're back we're here we're playing catch up uh, and we are trying to get back into our normal content production welcome to the show dave thank you yeah how long have we been planning that advanced course o over a year of no joke like six hour phone calls at a time uh I just turned technical difficulties. I just turned my headphones on in my recording software, so I don't know if I stepped on your toes in the in the opening here, and I don't know if what you said got recorded or not. But let's try again. Welcome to the show, Dave. Hello. Hey. So yeah, that was hello. So that was what a at least a year, if not more, of six hour phone calls regularly planning out the advanced course. Yes. And it actually all panned out i'd say i'm very happy with how it turned out how about you uh yes my favorite part about that was we were planning a two-day course and we were planning a three-day course and we decided to put the two of those together just one after the other and while we had done that already we were saying to each other man wouldn't it be great to teach a five-day course and kind of accidentally we designed that so i think that was really cool that just uh the organic approach of doing what we love doing turned into us doing basically our dream course that we taught. Yeah. Oh, and this is a, a root beer here. A really good I have, a root beer in a bottle. Okay, nice. I have a rum and Coke. Uh, but yeah, and it was a proof of concept course for us, but we could not have gotten better with the host, with the students. Uh, you said 517 Media was absolutely fantastic to work with. So even though this was just a proof of concept for our first course ever for actually teaching the advanced material, 
I just I feel like it was a slam dunk all around and just everyone involved was so great to work with and hang out with. Give a shout out to to Marcus and my of cloaked entry co Marcus was a student uh, and then my came up and hung out a couple days uh, brought amazing cookies. So that was huge. We had a another student. Uh, we won't publicly say his name. Uh, but yeah, just cannot believe the cool humans that we got to associate with protective ops on Instagram was the host for the event. And that's really what made the experience and could not have dreamed of a better group to pilot our, our new course with. Yes. Lots of things to go out. It was, um, that's one of the coolest things about, uh, the current chapter of my life that I'm living is that I don't have to choose my friends, um, uh, based on the people that I'm forced to be around all day. So if I don't want to interact with someone, I don't. So if I'm interacting with you, that's because I like you, or at least I like you enough to, to interact with you because I have the choice to not do that. Um, in the military and in law enforcement and in almost any bureaucratic job, you are forced to have people in your life, whether you like them or not. And now I just, it was so good for me personally, just to be around really cool people doing really cool things. Uh, it was also really nice to not be around a captive audience. So everyone that was there wanted to be there. And that made me really happy. Um, man, it was just really enjoyable. Uh, cool. okay, let's, the, oh, I'm sorry. Go oh, ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, and just didn't want to forget to shout out the uh, people that were in the TLP course, the usual course we teach. Such a great batch of students, too. We had a uh, another guy who was super, super interesting, super cool guy. He had to jet to take care of some business. But, yeah, just didn't want to leave anyone out just between the TLP and the advanced course. Yep. And, the yeah, so cool. All right, and let's get into have, it. Let's mention uh, Zach. And we had uh, two twins that showed up that were super cool dudes. Uh, Zach was a younger cat, which uh, we might talk about it more in this episode. We might not. I don't want to give too much personal information away um, without double verifying that that's cool with people. But, but we had a young student in the course. Um, and it was really cool for him to be around a bunch of people that were, you know, 10 years or more his senior. So he performed really well. Um, and I hope he got a lot out of it. We had two twins show up. Um, I saw two different emails and they were both different by like one letter for the signups. Um, and I was like, oh, maybe it's a husband and wife. Maybe it's like, you know, two brothers. Maybe it's like, I don't know, something. And so when they showed up, they were like just super duper easygoing, like, joking around like positive happy dudes um, very very engaged and wanting to learn the skill set so that made me really happy we had aaron s um super longtime friend super longtime supporter of everything that you and i have done for gosh since we've known him like just the first to jump on any big project that we're involved with so we're really thankful that we got to see him in person uh, this is the first time you met him in person right i think i met him earlier this year at a syrup at a cloaked entry co course yeah, uh, for sure. Yeah, I I mean, yeah, so Aaron, super cool guy, uh, huge asset, so yeah, cool. Performed well, really well. We're going to get into that a little bit uh, in the debrief. Uh, and then the last cool. one I have here, unless I'm forgetting anybody, thanks again to Protective Ops. Super, absolutely fantastic host. Um, and Oni no Hanzo as a uh, honorary student. We have been collaborating with him for a very long time. Um, he was all lined up to take the course, um, but we were unable to get him into a seat. Uh, but I'm sure that we will see him again very soon. Fantastic. All right. So let's get into to chronologically. Let's start at the beginning when we got into town. Cool. Uh, so I took a nice long drive in the car, me and Arrow. Um, we always try to get into the classroom the night before. Um, for me, this is not a make or break. It's not a deal breaker. Um, and we're not, because I know that one of the goals of UTAC is that I understand that we are a small business. Um, I call us a one man show, but with, I mean, we are definitely a community, um, operation with you and your help, um, with the hosts help with our students and our, our peers and our fellow collaborators. It's not, it is not just me. Um, but as far as, um, CEOing, I guess you can call it. Um, I know that we're very small, 
And one of our goals is to be very flexible. So I have to work small and flexible into as many details about the business as possible. That includes logistics, big time. So showing up to a course. If I only get access to the classroom an hour or 30 minutes before the event starts, fine. Um, that is not a deal breaker. I just schlep my gear in, I throw it on all the tables, I line it up real pretty, and we just start teaching. Uh, the problem with that for me is uh, my gear is heavy, and I'm always taking tons of trips into and out of the car and through the classroom. So even if even if it's not super duper hot out, um, I still end up like sweaty and smelling like you know like the nervous sweats. Um, then I have to go like change my shirt and like breathe and like splash water on my face. And then I go teach. Uh, so getting in the night before is not a deal breaker, but it does allow us to the next morning wake up, walk in, hand out padlocks, and start. So that was really nice for me. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I had a much lighter load than all the many Pelican cases uh, that that you have, but it's really nice just to have everything laid out and just cut down on the admin time during class so we can focus our time on actually teaching and interacting. So I want the value for the audience to be, um, there was a theme for maybe the last 10 or 20 episodes that we uh, sporadically would spice in some uh, curriculum development or course development, course design uh, concepts. I want the audience to get some value today for hearing a constructive debrief happen about an event. I also want this to be, I'm I'm gonna post this on any future course pages uh, where students can click to sign up for the course. Um, I will link this episode. Um, so that they can hear how the course went, and so they can hear that we we are constantly trying to improve our curriculum. They can hear what, um, just for this one specific course, what went wrong and what went right, um, and what we might be doing in the future. So I think it's a, uh, I think that that should be my focus for the value for the audience on this episode. So we're not doing this just as a pat on the back. I mean, we we made some mistakes certainly, um, but I think that it's really cool to give insight to the audience in, in the year 2022 now. Um, I'm surprised that there's tactical courses that I want to go to that I can't find out like what it, what it would be like to be a student in that course. Like you just get a photo and a course description and you're expected to pay several hundred dollars just to show up. So I like that we give students a behind the scenes look. Cool. Yeah. And hopefully this helps other people who have interest in designing their own courses or who would like to attend one of our courses, get a better idea of what it's all about and what the experience is like. Can you hear the dog crying in the background? Yes. Oh my God. We have puppies on the farm and it is, <laughs> let, me just, let me put like a sweater on the, on the floor by the door. I have my sound sound pads up and it's not helping. Sure. Uh, let me let me pause this for one second. Okay, I did the best I can, um, and they're also puppies, so I expect that that whining will stop shortly. But I tried to pat it up a little bit. All right, we're cool. Back. Sorry. All right. Yeah, and on the topic of setup, again, we mm-hmm. shouted out uh, protective ops in the beginning, but it was such a good facility for that nice big classroom. More so for the advanced course, but super generous with having free reign just to swap out locks and doorknobs all over the facility. Uh, but yeah, so just having a host helped with that. Such a good host helped so much with that setup. And just since I've been involved, I've seen the organization improve with different Pelican cases. Everything is gradually getting more organized, cutting down on that admin time as much as we can. Standardizing locks when we're done with them back to zero 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 for combination locks stuff like that uh so yeah, yeah i'd say setup for the tlp course was pretty uneventful did you want to hit um set up for the advanced course now or just do it purely uh chronologically and hit that later uh let's work through it yeah go for it okay sure so um well here so let's keep it purely chron chronological so we'll just do the tlp stuff now mm-hmm. so just yeah just getting the student desks and area set up uh they get about 170 ish dollars worth of take-home tools right off the bat and then a copy of the tlp book which is yeah, that, 50 bones that you wrote so for over 200 already for just sitting down at the course yeah and we try and give students space to have a work area to move around and collaborate with each other so having a big classroom was 
great for that. We did a little bit of rearranging of the, of the space just to allow for that, but that's really all I have on setup. Anything else uh, you got or? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So since we're also touching on curriculum development a little bit, uh, something I think would be fun to share with the audience, which is kind of behind the scenes info is because you and I were working on this curriculum for about a year. Um, and because I had been to the facility and you had not, um, if we were going to pre prepare, um, scenarios or drills or operations in the facility that we knew we had access to, um, I could see those a lot better in my mind than you could, even though I sent you the occasional, I sent you some photos from when I was there last year, uh, with, um, cloaked entry co. Um, but once we both got on scene the very first day, bef uh, the day before class started, it was so nice to walk around and say, Hey, check out this flow of rooms, check out these things we could do, check out, you know, we could switch these door handles so that we have this, this, and this, you know, we can go from this room to that room, but not this one to that one. Hey, look, here's a dark room. Hey, look, the, you know, this room is the farthest from the door and, and this double room is the closest to the door. So you and I being able to kind of prime our brains, um, even though we had, uh, scenarios and operations written down on paper, we now could anchor that with real life together at the same time, like with both of us, like with putting our hands on the same obstacles. So that was really nice um, on the setup day. Yeah, agreed. So we'll get into how that played into the advanced course. So let's slam through the TLP stuff. Um, I'm pretty sure you've done debriefs on TLP before. So we'll go ahead yeah, and it. recap what happened and then really and then really spend the meat of the show on the advanced course. How does that sound? Yeah, let's do it. I'll take cool. uh, if you want to start talking, I will start taking some notes so that we can flow kind of in order of the blocks that we taught. Yeah, sure. So uh, tactical lock picking is the usual course DLP focuses mostly with the framing of emergency lockout. Uh, so be it a first responder or just a regular citizen. It's usually assumed that you have the moral right to make entry and the urgency required is appropriate to pick a lock. I know there's kind of jokes about people who always go to bolt cutters, but sometimes it is most appropriate to just break a window or break something. Uh, so it's all about the framing in the context of any situation. So we start with the 60 second crash course. We hand people a padlock. We hand them some picks and give them about 60 seconds of, of explanation. And within two or three minutes, almost every student has an open. Uh, just take these tools in your hand, hold the lock like this, do this motion. And we have students opening common locks that you'll find everywhere throughout the country in all kinds of uses. Uh, we do other things like decoding locks. So common combination locks there's a couple different methods to what's called decode them meaning either feel with a thin piece of metal where the dials need to be or other things like pulling on the shackle of the lock to figure out where the dials need to be we covered that we covered door attacks so a lot of people are probably familiar with the credit card trick that they've seen in movies that type of stuff uh, from both sides of the door that type of attack is different from the pull or push side of the door because of the door jam. Uh, so different tools, different techniques a little bit. Some nuances on what type of latches allow for that and how to make latches allow you to do that. Under the door attacks, reaching under with an under the door tool and pulling down a handle that either opens the door or at least unlocks the handle on the other side. You, you reach under and around the door and snag it. Uh, some nuances with what handles allow for that and what don't. Uh, we did lunch the first day, went to a pizza place, ate with everyone. Um, the days are kind of running together and now. Yeah, this is already a lot too. last. Yeah, this is already last week. So luckily for the audience, the uh, places that we went for lunch or dinner don't really matter. So if we get them mixed up, only about five people will know. But uh, yeah, uh, cover. <laughs> Bless you. We cover auto entries like uh, vehicle entries. That's always cool. Get people experience on different types of tools for that. And then you get people experience on different types of locks. Uh, so people may have heard of wafer locks, warded locks, 
those are mostly what we cover in TLP as far as other types of locks. Let's see, anything else on the first day that I missed? I'm looking right now. Um, I'll just give my overview thoughts, uh, which were we have done this before and we're practiced at it. Um, and I think the biggest piece of the probably the biggest thing that makes us different is you'll notice what we didn't do, um, what we didn't say. Um, and if you're new to listening to this or if you're new to taking our courses, our students sit down and start picking open a padlock within the first 10 seconds of the course starting. Like, it's like, okay, is everyone here? Here's a padlock, open it up. Um, we, I think our, our host protective ops gave a brief, um, about here's the bathrooms. Like, uh, there's medical emergency. I'll take care of it. Like super quick. Um, not even, not, not like a shooting range medical brief, but like, Hey, we're here. We're here to help you. You know, Pat and Dave have the floor. Bathrooms are here. Help yourself. Bye. Like it was, his briefing was maybe 30 seconds. And we said, okay, the floor is ours. Here's your padlocks. Here's your tools. Open up your cases and go. I didn't even say, hello, I'm Pat. Um, I didn't say, hello, this is Dave. We just started. And we we didn't need a projector. We didn't have a PowerPoint. We didn't show videos or photos. Um, if we did, we'd maybe pull something up on our phone. Um, and there is an absolute ridiculous wealth of value. And in, in, it's not that if you do PowerPoint, you're wasting time. But in the ability to have students actively learning with tools in their hands from the first moment all the way into the last. Cool. Yeah, and then I thought it was cool. We made sure to do lunch and dinner with everyone. Good bonding. Really cool to hang out with all the students. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed just everyone as humans. But cool. So that's pretty much day day one. Unless you got anything else. You ready for day two? Let's do it. Day two. Day two, we started off with scenarios. So when we do scenarios, we focus on troubleshooting and target assessment and um, ways of thinking. We don't have a scenario where we have a black and white right answer. If a student can explain their thought process and if it makes sense, we talk a lot about making sure to give them that win. We don't say, no, that's wrong. We wanted you to do X or Y. Uh, but it's really a lot of trade-offs, troubleshooting, and prioritization in our scenarios so that we try and get people to do hands-on stuff. Ooh, uh, let's talk about the chain on the table yeah, scenario. I was just going to say it. Yeah. Cool. All right. All right. So you take that one. Uh, so speaking of a win, there's a, a method that we use while we're actively teaching and we call it, um, a success plus a failure. So what it does is it allows the student to basically run five or six or seven scenarios all in one scenario. And how we, uh, how we do that is we get a locked obstacle like a chain or a door, or a padlock or a car or whatever. And as soon as they do something where the obstacle is now unlocked and open, we say, great, you won. However you did that, it's a success because the goal is not to practice a certain technique. The goal is to get the thing open. So it's okay if you use a different technique, if you see a different way. We encourage that. So we'll tell them, yes, you succeeded. That's really cool. That was really fast. Hey, we're proud of you. You did this really well. And then we'll say, if that didn't work for some reason, what would you do next? So we'll then shut the door or you know, close the padlock or whatever. So then they'll go, oh, if that didn't work, I would do this. And we go, great, try that. And then they try it and they go, oh, I got it open. I, we go, great, that's two wins now. Keep going. Pretend that didn't work. What else could you think of to try? So it's a positive, 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 very positive experience. Instead of, um, you know, it's very, very, very easy and tempting for people that are young instructors or inexperienced instructors or just overly excited instructors or just assholes uh, to want your students to lose so that you can sound smarter than them. They call that instructor masturbation. Um, the first time I heard about that was in uh, On Combat by Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman. Um, and they call it instructor masturbation because it does nothing but gratify the instructor and make him feel good while doing nothing for anybody else. 
and I think that's really funny, and I like that. Um, but we try to avoid that at all costs. And and we're not perfect either. We fuck up all the time. But we do try to put a lot of very intentional effort into um, never ostracizing a student, um, never eliciting participation, and then making fun of the student for participating. Um, so anytime we ask for a hand raise or ask a question to the class, like, hey, how many people have ever tried this? And they raise their hands, and we go, cool, tell me about it. Instead of going, oh, that's stupid. You shouldn't have done that. Uh, so we try not. We try to create an environment. We don't try to just teach a task anyways yeah, and, back on track sorry sure. <laughs> the, the, we oh. put a chain around the table and we had looked at one two three maybe three or four different attack vectors that we expected the student to use and all of them would have been a success there was one we didn't see uh, that the student saw that was the fastest and easiest method to get that chain off the table um now that i've ranted i would love if you would take over because i want to take a sip of my root beer sure so Picture, if you will, dear listeners, uh, the table was maybe about a uh, foot and a half wide, so not so not super wide, and I don't know, maybe about eight feet long, so a yeah. long, skinny table. So we had a chain wrapped around the table with two padlocks, and one padlock actually secured the chain, and one didn't. It was just the chain looped back on itself, but at first glance, it did look like both padlocks plausibly would get the chain off. Instead of even doing that, the student folded the legs of the table down and just slid it off the end. And that's my favorite thing. When I see something and I learn something and something takes me by surprise, I am genuinely so happy to celebrate that with the student. Uh, So that was awesome. That blew our minds. We were looking for some other outcomes, which were good, too. Like you said, there were a few different things that we were looking for. Uh, But, yeah, that was just cool. And we talk a lot about solving the problem. I mean, there is a time to practice the technique itself, but when we're doing scenarios, we want students to get that real life thought process and target assessment of solve the problem first, don't get tunnel vision on doing the technique. So that was a huge win. And then the other scenario we did that morning is we had access to two doors that had two locks on them each. So four total locks that were susceptible to different things. And the other scenario didn't really have right or wrong answers. It was more getting the student's thought process, giving them things to think about, target assessment and prioritization, and wor- and working through that with the students. So those were our two scenarios on day two of uh, the tactical lockpicking portion, which is our usual course. Anything else in those before we roll into what else we taught? Nope. Stunning. Let's do it. Cool. We did restraint escape, so flex cuffs, kinetic brakes, handcuffs, uh, paracord, duct tape, stuff like that. Had students get experience being restrained and breaking out of restraints. Um, you put me on the ground and kneeled on my back and put me in flex cuffs. I uh, saw it out with paracord. Had students do the same thing. Uh, handcuff keys out of bobby pins, out of hair berets. Um, kinetic breaks and yeah what else you got on restraint escapes uh, one of my favorite ones believe it or not is the last one that we teach which is the loop and shimmy where we very seriously tie a student's hands together with something like 550 cord um, then we teach them a really simple method for how to manage uh, loosening that and getting your hands out so I don't know why just for some reason um, I mean they're all kind of aha moments which I love like that's one <laughs> that's one of the coolest like rewarding things that we do is every time a student has those eyeballs that are like, Oh, um, and it's, I don't know. It's hard to explain. Yes. Every technique has the propensity for that, but also the restraints are like, Oh, I did it. Uh, Oh, I did it again. Like, Oh, look like, so every single one of those is, I guess it's, maybe it's the pop culture, uh, that you think, or like, you know, kind of the just culture in general, that if you think something has a key and is locked, then you can't open it. So it's cool that every single tool and technique is designed to counter that uh, pre- predisposition to thinking that that's the case. Um, restraints uh, just as much so. Um, yeah. Especially when it's a technique that's unexpected um, or that's simple in its application. So I just, I like that 550 chord wrap when you just loop, 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 you know, loop their hands together a bunch of times and then we teach them how to get out of it. Yeah. And I, and I like that block because when we turn the students loose and walk around just 
working with people in different types of restraints. It's cool because it's a very persistent skill set. You have to struggle against the restraint for a while. You have to put yourself in uncomfortable positions. It's just really cool to see students work through that. I learn stuff from seeing cool ways students work through that. So that's always a cool block. And two, when, when we split up and walk around and, and do coaching, students progress at different speeds. We let them practice with what restraints they want to practice with. We didn't really cover this explicitly yet, but a big thing we do too is tell students, hey, if you want to pick on locks while we're talking about other stuff, if you want to practice on restraints while we're talking about other stuff, have at it. Uh, so we had some students working on bobby pin handcuff and handcuff shim stuff while we were talking about other stuff, which we support and encourage. Fantastic. Uh, after lunch on the second day of tactical lock picking, I know we had a lot of open time and I know we got a lot of things done. Um, I remember teaching the snap gun. I remember teaching about bump keys. Um, can you help me refresh my memory with some of those things we did on that last day? Yeah, it's all oh, yes. run. Um, uh, Marcus and Aaron taught uh, some single pin picking to their co-students. We did some oh, of that yes. on the last day. Uh, was that the day that we all should have did the Lishy pick decoders? Yeah, we did spend a lot of time on the Lishy picks because I remember my, um, from Cloak Dentrico, brought in cookies on that uh, second day. No, was, was it? She came in on Saturday. Yeah, that so was, maybe... We did Lishy picks on Saturday. Yeah, my, my mistake. We might have briefed the Lishy same. picks on the end of the, on the second day of training. Um, yeah. I know we had students working on practice stands with deadbolts and knobs. Mm-hmm. Uh, so day two for the a- for the afternoon, we let students push skills they had already learned further. Oh. And if they wanted to to learn specific stuff too, uh, like that like that other stuff you listed, we kind of shape shape this last part of the class to the students we have what they're interested in. Um, I cool. remember and, doing a uh, a smart key camera decode and punching a brand new key out. Um, and our smart key camera died in the process of that, um, but we got it working. I also remember pouring a molten key uh, from a cast on the second day of TLP. Cool. And then, Aaron, and then one of our students, uh, Aaron, just messaged me with the assist uh, hinge removal tool under the door yeah. tool and and some more latch uh, slipping practice. But I think the takeaway here is that usually the second half of the second day is molded specifically to what that group of students wants to do with with their time yep. is the takeaway. And then we had uh, Marcus um, Sky Pirate Actual taught a block on hinge removal. Um, I know Aaron and, and Marcus both helped teach the class single pin picking. Um, so that's something else we, we recommend for the totality of our courses, which is peer teaching. Um, we, you don't have to be an expert. You don't have to be an instructor. Um, if you can get a technique to work and a person next to you can't, uh, we encourage students to, uh, not necessarily to give unwanted advice, but um, you can you know, lean over and tell the student next to you, hey, I tried this thing, see if that works for you. Um, or the student can ask around, you know, whether it's an instructor or another student, um, to be teaching as soon as you learn. Uh, so we try to do that throughout the whole course. And we did yeah. some guest instructors teaching um, as well as a lot of peer teaching. And one of my favorite things to do is when someone's been working hard on something, working hard, working hard, working hard, and they finally get it, I like to ask them, oh, was there like an aha moment or a specific mm-hmm. thing that did it for you? Because that helps me learn as an instructor. And I think that's beneficial to the people around them of, hey, this is what it took to click in my brain or this is what it took – for me to understand it, which is super valuable, I think, to me and to everyone. So I don't ask it to put people on the spot. Mm-hmm. But that's something I specifically try to go around and ask because I think it's just such value. Um, but cool. So did you want to wrap up TLP and get on to the advanced course debrief? Uh, one last thing that we might have forgotten. Did you um, – I've been busy typing while you were talking, um, so I didn't catch everything you said. Did you mention that our bypass driver issue? Oh, no. Yeah, let's Fantastic. Fantastic point. All right. Yeah. Take it away. Okay. So 
we, I try to tell the students early on in the class. Um, I don't always remember. I've actually, I used to have it written down in a block. So I'd give the crash course to students. I'd say, hey, pick this padlock open. Okay, great. Now let's do the intro block. I've just removed that. Um, we just we just teach. So now I just, we start the class, we start teaching. And I update students with important information as we go. Um, the great thing about that is we're always teaching and students are getting the most possible value. Uh, the bad thing about that is on occasion, some housekeeping goes missing. Uh, not a huge deal. Um, you, you're certainly, I mean, we're trying to give you as much value as humanly possible. And in that process, every course ends up being different. We forget one or two bullet points, you know, of instruction, but we also are flooding the students with knowledge the whole time. So, um, I think that's just life that every course can't be the same. And I think that that's a good thing for us. So one of the things we try to tell students early on in the course that we try not to forget is that you're going to see me, the instructor, Pat, you're going to see me fail. Any of my assistant instructors I work with, you're going to see them fail. Um, and the students are going to try a technique and it's going to fail and they're going to have to struggle and troubleshoot. And sometimes they just won't get an opening. And we tell students that is a good thing. Coming to this course and seeing me hold up a padlock and go, this is an easy padlock. Watch this. And trying to open it and it not opening. That's really, really good. And it's not just me. Um, we have a good oh, friend yeah. in our circles who's a world-class like champion speed single pin picker. And I handed that guy like a master number three. And I was like, hey, can you walk me through single pin picking? And then five minutes later, like, he still didn't have it open. He's like, shit, I don't know what's going on. And it happens. It happens to world-class champions. It happens to consummate professionals with badges and bags and guns and, you know, super cool watches and ratchet belts. And it happens to me, and it happens to every student. So you're going to fail. That's my long intro to telling you. I ordered five or six um, American bypass drivers from Peterson. And I've been telling people for a long time, you know, those are the ones to get. Sparrows has one. Um, I like it, but it's a little bit difficult. It's kind of, it slips in my hand a little bit. I just have a hard time turning it because it's a rounded handle. I don't think it's a bad tool. I just, it's not my favorite. Uh, so I use the Petersons um, and I have always had great success with them. On occasion, one will come in the mail, like I'll get two and one of them just doesn't work because I, I think it's a machining process. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's really a quality process. I think it's just the engineering has to be so specifically correct in such a tiny, small space on that tool. Um, and whatever machining they use seems that they're not getting a consistent tool design on every tool. So every once in a while, one of them doesn't work or it doesn't work well. I ordered six, which were expensive. Um, and all six of them, we couldn't get a single open. It took us maybe five to 10 minutes to get one of them to work on a couple what? padlocks that historically we'd opened every single time the course before. So I don't think the yeah. problem was in the lock. I think the problem was in all six bypass drivers. But we almost couldn't teach the course of instruction to the students. We were like, listen, we, we're supposed to teach you this, but we can't. Like, none of these tools are working. Um, and the takeaway is if we send them out to the field and we say, look, here's the perfect tool. Here's the perfect lock. Put them together. It w opens every time. And they go buy the tool and they put it in their bag and they deploy. And they go, oh, no, time to save someone's life. Don't get the bolt cutters. Just let me open a lock with this tool. Let's take our time, do to do, take the thing out. Oh no, it doesn't even fit in the keyway. What do I do? That would be bad. So we tell them, you know, the takeaway is tools don't always work. Check your tools. Order multiples if the tool's known to be not very reliable. You know, bring multiples of them into the field if they're known to not be very reliable. Uh, so that was a really telling experience. I'm very happy that we did that. Um, and honestly, I don't sweat when those things happen. Um, I guess maybe I used to when I was younger, but I, I mean, this course was built on the same philosophy that I've been using since day one, which is you learn a lot more from your failures than from your successes. And, you know, unlike a young shooting instructor who says, watch this, and they miss, and they kind of sweat and go, uh, that's, that's never been an issue for, for what we teach, which is, hey, watch this. Oh, I'm sucking. Listen, this is real life. That happens. So I'm glad that that happened. No skin off my back. Um, I think it was a good lesson for the students too. Yeah, yeah, it was crazy too. I yeah, like you said, I think we got one or two of them to work on, like one or two pad blocks of maybe five or six blocks we had floating around. Um, and then we actually had a sparrows one on hand, and that one was working in, 
I think every lock I tried, the Sparrows one was working that I had with me, just my oh. personal one. So, yeah, just crazy. And Peterson historically makes a lot of really good stuff, so I don't know if it was just, like, a specific batch of, of manufacturing. I mean, so historically they have good stuff, so the lesson isn't to trash on Peterson. It's just to say, hey, check your tools. Uh, we won't belabor this point too long, but just a good lesson, too, of, hey, test your tools before you go. But something like a bypass driver is bendable. So if you use it too much before you need it, you might bend it out of shape practicing with it. Uh, so just a lot of nuance in there with the uh, bypass drivers. But cool. Well, on to the advanced course then. Yeah? Or you let's got more? It. Nope, let's do it. All right. So night one. of So we ended TLP in the afternoon. And then we told students, hey, be at the safe house at 8.30 p.m. We're going to start our first operation. So from a course design standpoint, um, we wanted the first operation to be a TLP skills-based one, not getting into the key gen or the other advanced um, like skills that we were going to be teaching in the next couple days. Also, because the students don't have to take the TLP portion first before the advanced course if they don't want to. For the advanced course, we do ask that the students be familiar and somewhat skilled in the TLP concepts they don't have to take our tlp course to do that we can kind of sort that out with a phone call if they take a class from cloaked entry or surreptitious services or if they self-teach definitely not a requirement to have to take our course to take the advanced course we just want to make sure that students who are giving us their time and money to show up for the advanced course we're giving pure value and not having to you know teach stuff that we already teach in a prior course uh, but anyways so First night meant to be more heavy on TLP application at night in a facility, uh, almost like a pop quiz to see where they're at. So we're not trying to test students. We're trying to learn with students. Um, but yeah, so noise discipline, light discipline. We had the perfect facility for it. Like I said, we had free reign over changing stuff out on exterior doors, interior doors, everything. And... Let's see how into the um, details of the objectives that we concocted for the students. Did you want to get? Um, we'll we'll just keep it vague in general. I don't want to uh, ruin the magic for future students, but um, the plan was so a general briefing was: Hey, welcome to the safe house. You know, find your bedroom, put your shit on your bed, come back out because we're briefing in five minutes. And then we gave the brief and we said roughly. You have 30 minutes to plan, and then the vehicle's leaving with you or without you. So plan, pack the gear that you're going to bring, wear the clothes that you're going to bring, and here's your objective. Cool. And we said yep, to the so students, we're going to take you to a facility. We're going to drop you off. Your job is to get into the facility, find a specific room, and then do a specific thing inside that locked room, and then to leave uh, without leaving a trace. Cool. And the way this differs... We've covered this a little bit in the past, but the way this differs from a scenario is this is an operation. So the students had the briefing to do their whole planning. So they got to use resources that they had available or experiences they'd had to talk about the layout of the facility, to talk about what tools they would bring, what tools they wouldn't bring. How would they carry those tools? How would they manage noise and light discipline? So way more expansive than just a scenario of setting up a student and saying, hey, you got this lock in front of you. You got these tools. What decisions do you make? Still a high value exercise, but the operation, we try to kick up a whole nother level with the application and decision making involved. Um, so we also aren't necessarily teaching like field craft or trade craft. We would love to. But honestly, we didn't even have enough time to teach all the entry-related stuff we had talked about in the advanced course, much less taking time to do a bunch of other stuff. So we weren't failing or grading students on their operational stuff. We would have lots of discussions. We would do lots of learning on it. We would you know, work with students to improve anything like noise or light discipline. But we weren't telling students, no, this was wrong. No, that was dumb. That was bad. It was the things we're really, quote unquote, like grading you on are your entry skills. 
But if you want to take these concepts and apply them in an advanced fashion, you do have to be aware of all these other things. So let's have a discussion how it went, what we could have done better, have a discussion on how the actual application of that pan panned out. Uh, but yeah, so night one, nothing too crazy as far as key generation, but way more application than we ever have students do in the standard TLP course. What else you got on night one? Uh, uh, not what? Not much. That was really enjoyable for me. Um, I'll I'll add one note that you and I talked a lot about this. Um, that I think we made the mistake of recommending to to our students that we wanted to set a standard um, or an environmental kind of concept of not letting them be too far on the side of LARPing, like taking it super serious and worrying about like worrying about uh, like foot patrols and cameras and like heat sensors and satellites. But, and, and like, so G we, and like yeah. GPS cell phone tracking. So we didn't want to go that far on, on the spectrum, uh, but we also didn't want students going like, Oh, hoka doke. Yeah. Like I'm just going to walk right up to the front door and start picking cause uh, whatever. Um, so we recommended to students, we said, let's shoot for a middle line. So you don't have to crawl around on the ground like a ninja, but we also don't want you like going, oh, I hope nobody sees me. Like we didn't want you goofing off. And I think that was our mistake is we should have gone slightly more towards the side of like full on LARP. And I don't say that um, as a, uh, I don't know, the, it's not a negative statement. Like I think it's fantastic. Like, yeah, you're here for a covert entry course. Let's do covert entries. Um, and I think it's better to put yourself in the mental headspace of, Oh, okay. If this were a real operation, what would I have to consider? Because that's where I think a lot more learning could happen. I think if you take it casual and you you aren't concerned about, you know, any repercussions for your actions and you just kind of breeze through it and don't put a lot of effort into the mental headspace, I think you have less of an opportunity to learn object, to learn your craft. So, I'll leave it at that. Um and the purpose of doing these operations for Dave and I it was very, very clear. So we said, yes, we can teach people how to you know, pull bidding from a key. We can teach them how to cut a key. We can teach them how to pick a lock. But operations are never, you know, you're not going to join some super secret covert spy agency. And they go, all right, guys, you know what we need? An operation so that we can get to that building and then pick the lock and then we win. Well, no, you're using the skill set of gaining entry so that you can get in and do the thing on the inside. So what we wanted to do was take the skill set of lock picking and key generation. And instead of in your brain going, if I pick the lock, I win. We wanted to move that back a little farther in the brain so that they said, we have to get in the building to find this object. Oh, I also happen to have lock picks with me. So let's get this lock out of the way and then I'll get in and do the thing. If that makes sense. So we wanted to shift around your kind of brain power. Um, so you're focusing on the operation and you're also choosing to make a certain type of entry uh, kind of behind the scenes there in your brain. Yeah, the way I think of it is there are a lot of great, concise three-minute YouTube videos demoing a tool or a technique, yes. uh -huh. which nothing against those. Like some people don't want to watch 10 minutes of failures, but what we try and do, <laughs> but like that's real life, you yeah. know, like yeah, so like I get it. So making a well-produced, concise three-minute video from a world-class practitioner, cool, awesome. We want to teach people the things that you can't learn from a YouTube video. You can learn how to how to ideally do a technique in a three-minute YouTube video. You can't learn all the pitfalls and nuances and troubleshooting just from a YouTube video. So that's what we really strive to do. And I hope we succeeded in that. I'm pretty sure we did but i guess the students would have to be the judge of that uh but cool yeah so night one uh we started the operation of you know not too crazy late into the evening did it got back they got some uh intel from the operation and we set up the next day cool so uh stayed up i don't i uh, don't think we we broke out the super nintendo the first night maybe the next night i forget yeah. But uh, mistake. We should have opened that thing earlier. Cool. All right. All right. So, but we, 
yeah, we're up late, having fun. Wake up, day two. What do we do then? Day two, and let's uh, let's move through it a little bit with the with the tools and techniques because that's kind of the things that the students are learning. And so this isn't really a learn how to do podcast. This is a concept podcast or episode. So we woke up and we we taught the students right off the bat. Uh, we kind of had a nice loose breakfast where, like, if you want to go get breakfast, you go get breakfast. If you wanted to grocery shop the night before or the morning and come back and cook, you cook. Uh, so it just kind of, as we woke up, we started kind of moseying around. And then breakfast was Real over quick. and we said, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry to interrupt, but I forget if we called out specifically for the advanced course. We wanted, like, a team house or team living situation environment. So we rented uh-huh. an Airbnb house. We were all hanging out together. Sleeping there, eating there. Uh, but anyways, sorry to interrupt yes. just for the audience. I, I uh, didn't know if we specifically called that out. So we're all we hanging not. out. Cool. All right. So continue. So people so we were wake up in the team house. Yes. And we go. have breakfast. However, we choose to have breakfast. And we taught one, two, three, four different methods for pulling bidding from a key. One of those methods involves taking a photo of a key. So after we learn that method of taking a photo with a key... Um, we went right into an afternoon field operation. Uh, we're just going to gloss over this one really quickly. We hammered this thing in our debrief um, because this is a proof of concept course. A lot of really unique things happen with that. Um, but even if we told you all the details, we would be shifting it for the future. So suffice it to say, uh, it was very exciting. Uh, it was very active. Um, you're not going to lose that experience in our next course. It's going to be better. <laughs> it's, they're always better. Yeah, better. A um, lot of... A lot of lessons learned for students, instructors, everyone involved, I think, learned a lot. It was definitely an experience. Yeah. Uh, with, <laughs> with Nothing, with nothing the, crazy, no drama. It's just no. anytime you're in yeah. public um, and you're focusing on doing a learning objective, you also have to take in a, into account you're in public. Uh, so it's not a controlled environment, that's all. Yeah, so I'm not going to go too deep into this, but normal people in public definitely realized there was a group of people up to something in public. Acting weird, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not a huge deal. No one got arrested. No. Cops weren't called. Uh, there were no arguments, no fights, like no interaction really with the public. It was just, uh, it was just, just odd. That's all. No big Yeah, deal. so just suffice to say, it centered on getting a picture of a key with which you could cut a key from like a lot of cool Instagram posts, you know, talk about don't show your keys because someone will cut a picture or will cut a key from the picture. We put that into practice in a uh, public oh, yeah. setting. So cool. So we uh, got through that. Got through that. Um, I don't remember where we had lunch either before or after that, but um, nighttime operation, we'll scoot right into that. So we hung out at the team house for a while, uh, did some more training methods on how to cut a key using multiple methods. And that took quite a while, um, but it's because we were practicing as we were doing it. It wasn't like, hey, here's an introduction. Next. Here's an introduction. Next. It was like, hey, here's how you do this. And the students were both like, oh, yeah, let's do more of that. Like, let's refine it. Let's get it to work. Let's spend some time on it. Oh, look, there's another way. Cool. Let's do that. So they're kind of all the lessons kind of blended into one another. Um, I don't know if it was a good or bad thing. We'll have to kind of let that settle in our bra- our brains. But it was almost nonstop teaching at the team house. So we did key yeah. cutting methods, um, and then we prepared for the nighttime op. Anything you want to add before that op? Uh, we did. Did we do smart key camera on day two, or was that um, only for the final op? Like before the final op, we had them really I working. With- I can't remember if we uh, let them do that on the second day or the third day. I can't remember. Sure. Yeah. So quick set smart key. Just brief summary. Uh, not pickable in a traditional way there are people who can pick it with lock picks but it's not nearly the same as picking a standard pin tumbler lock there's a camera you actually insert into the lock itself with which to read how the lock is configured to then cut a key that'll be relevant later but for the audience as a brief overview of quick set smart key attack so there's a special camera they make for it uh so May or may not have done that, but we we definitely did not make the students use that on the operation on night two. So tell us about uh, night two operation. Sure. This one was different. Uh, The first operation was limited in scope, um, and there were no key cutting variables thrown in at all. 
the second operation started with um, using Intel from a previous key bidding and key cut operation. So it was a really nice start. Uh, and then they had multiple rooms they had to enter into the facility, not just one room to find one thing. Uh, this was a a more kind of permanent station within the building. So once you get in, go do all the things. Uh, I think the first night, the lights were very low. I think the second night, we, we turned most of the lights up in the facility, which I think is great for students. You know, you're getting, you're getting two separate um, environmental experiences. Uh, we also got a lot of uh, really good uh, photo and video footage with the lights on, so it's it's tough to do low light video. Uh, so let's see, we did you and I did a walkthrough with the intention of getting some ASMR audio footage or audio uh, content, which I think you'll. So we, I'll throw up a little bit of that in the beginning of this episode, which the audience will have already heard it, and I might close out the episode with some of that. But it's it was really cool just being quiet and moving around. Um, and the real, yeah. again, the real value was not, uh, it's not so much that the students were pr- playing pretend operator. Like, that's not the value. The value is, hey, I know how to pick a lock on a desk. Cool. That's way different than, oh, I'm, I'm locked out of this place and it's an emergency. I need to get in and I need to make smart decisions. And that's way different than, I'm on an operation and I've planned this operation and I have a thing to do inside that building and I need to manage all my tools, bringing them with me and not letting them fall to the floor and moving slowly and like, and wearing a bag that can hold all my tools and managing my bag without setting it on the ground. Or if I do set it on the ground, I can't just leave it there. Like, uh, so different types of application of the same skill allow that skill to grow exponentially in my opinion. Yeah. And you had mentioned our failures as instructors before, so we, you know, we were a little biased because we set it up, but we ran the scenario, us two, as like a team before the students got there. And we actually ran into one of the objectives that neither one of us could pick. And through a lot of non, and we're taking it seriously. So a lot of nonverbal silent communication or as, as silent as possible, which looking back, maybe some short whispers would have been helpful. So a cool lesson to learn. So we both gave a lock about three three minutes each and looked at each other and the scenario we were imagining communicated we've been on scene for too long let's get out of here and not complete this last objective so again we didn't just walk in and just bust open every lock easy peasy no problem even as instructors we both tried one and we're like nope let's go and that gets back to to how we teach scenarios not in operations How people are imagining what's in play, what's out of play, what the dangers are, what they're worried about, is going to be entirely different between each student's imagination and our imagination. We try to ask a lot what people had in their mind for the scenario and assess their thought process relative to their imaginary scenario, rather than saying, no, ours is right, yours is wrong. So in our imaginary scenario, we had been on scene for too long. We completed enough of the objectives to where staying on scene longer, you know, would have been bad. But so a couple lessons in there. We had a failure to to open a lock that both of us tried on. And that imaginary concept of the scenario made sense for how we envisioned it, but it might not have for how someone else envisioned it. Um, So cool. That was our walkthrough. And then we sent the students in. I think that's really, really big. Um, we said it a couple times. We, we say it a lot, which is making sure that we're starting with the open book and the open communication of explain to me what your, like, your decision-making process instead of, you know, tell me why you did that. And we can ask, like, oh, hey, why did you do this thing? With the intention of I'm excited to hear their answer of, of their decision-making process instead of tell me why you did this. And in my head, I'm preparing to tell them why they're wrong. Those are two different, two very different learning experiences. Um, So for example, uh, if one student is walking around the facility in his socks and he's taking his shoes off and another student is clomping around the hallways, instead of going, you're right, you're wrong. 
or you're wrong, you're right. Um, we can ask them either during or after the operation, hey, I noticed you took your shoes off. Can you tell me why you did that? And they might say, oh, I wasn't sure if anyone was in the building or not. I figured that was a safe bet. And the other student might go, oh, well, you said that there's, you know, no, there's no role players and there's no fighting and no, like, surprise people jumping out with guns. So I just figured, why would I spend extra time walking slowly with my socks when, who cares, the facility's empty? So neither of them would have been wrong if they explained that. And that's really, really common in lots of tactical schools is um, an instructor will say, hey, go do this thing. But there's no context given or, or few or little context. Um, really common that people will play the pretend game differently. And it's really common that a less good instructor um, won't allow the student to explain their full thought process. Um, or if they explain their thought process, the, the instructor will still say, uh, well, you know, you're wrong for thinking that. So, yeah, there's right and wrong things, but starting in the position of, I want to know how you are thinking about solving this unique problem, much, much, much better than, I want to know why you did that thing, you didn't have to do it, you're wrong. Man, beat that horse, horse to death yet? I was about to say the same thing, so cool. So we had the students do, do the thing, we changed out the knobs, um, instructed them to use different parts of the facility in a way than the first night. So it was a different experience. Different skills were used. Uh, one of our students, Aaron did end up with a working key. Um, that was the for... third night, I think. Oh, okay. I thought the second night had the Intel from the public operation, right? And yes. then cut a key based on that. On the third so operation. I... Okay. Yeah. It's all like running together. Okay, yeah. cool. Well, Either way, he cut a uh, key from a photo, and it, it worked, uh, which was super cool. Uh, so we had the students do that. We had a uh, special surprise after that operation on night two that involved them getting... Well, so actually, after oh, night right. one... So a, so after night one, we had them get restrained in the back of a vehicle. I feel like that's not too big of a spoiler. And they did some cool teamwork to get out of that. That was cool to see. And... Just a note to the audience, too. A lot of the things we're saying we don't want to spoil. We're not hiding knowledge from you. A lot of it is kind of the experiences. So we're happy to tell you. Like, there's no secret knowledge that we think that certain people don't deserve or not. It's more just, hey, if, like, you sign up for the course, we want it to be a fun experience, edge on, being on the edge of your seat type thing. Uh, so, yeah, just clarifying that we're not trying to hide information. We're trying to preserve the experience. Uh, so the students hid some restraint escape tools uh, and did some things to make searching for tools uh, much more difficult. Super smart on both their parts. Oh, this God, was, was one super of cool. Yeah, this this is one of the highlights for me because we both ran this restraint drill like at home and we're like, yeah, if like I got restrained like that, I'd just be fucked. Like, yeah, like uh, like we both had that experience. So we get in. So this is after a nighttime scenario that didn't start till late. So we we went really late. We probably didn't finish up to what, like 2 a.m. at least on yeah, night late two. One. Uh -huh. uh, so we both went into this second part thinking, oh, man, yeah, like this kicked both of our asses at home. This is going to be such like a huge like learning thing. And both the students just like Freeze it was nothing. It. Yeah. <laughs> So I was super happy to see it, but mm. like uh, super happy for our students' success, but was also like, no, like I thought this was going to be this whole teaching thing and like their minds were going to be blown. And, and they're just like, oh, no, they just did way better than uh, we did <laughs> at home. So that was super cool. Um, yeah, I think it was the next night but i'm just gonna say it now we had one of our students hide a handcuff shim in his mouth for three hours which was <laughs> incredibly impressive yeah, that was a third like night. holy cow yeah but uh so we'll cover that again on the third night but just in case i forget just wanted to shout that out Let's do uh, that cool uh um, what do we do the third morning sure so oh god uh third morning man it is all running together Let's see. I know we did. Let's see. Oh, uh, we did. Uh, let me look. For, uh, scenario. I don't. 
No, let's see. Uh... Oh yeah, so we, we, we were back. Decoding. Yeah, so I just got an assist again from one of our students who's listening live. Uh, so we went back up to the facility. We did more work there. We did a lot with the Lishi decoder picks. Uh, there were some interesting nuances to those locks there that actually made it, I think, a little harder than a standard lock. So that was really cool. So we spent a while getting reps on the Lishi decoder picks. Uh, we spent a while up at the facility, so that was cool. Uh, students had access to, again, a number of different tools and a number of different um, doors and knobs. I think the uh, third morning was more of a kind of the freeform time of yeah. let's work on, on what the students want to work with, not too structured, but hey, our time is your time. We're at your disposal. Let's work on what you guys want to work on. We had kind of planned on touching on things like impressioning, but we stayed pretty busy with other stuff, and impressioning for our framing, at least, is not as relevant as some other techniques. So while we included tools for that in the student take-home kit, we actually ended up running out of time for that. Uh, so we had that lined up, but we didn't end up doing it. Uh, but yeah, just kind of let the students direct the free time. And I think everyone was pretty tired because we we're probably up till about 3 a.m. each night as well and up and going by like 8 to 9 a.m. each day. Uh, I mean, you know, that wasn't like a hard and fast timeline or hard and fast thing of we're going to deprive you of sleep and put you under so much stress. Uh, just kind of naturally how things went. So by day three, we we're taking it a little easier, the pace was a little slower, and letting it be a little more student-directed than everyone sit down and do these things. So then did you want to get on to um, night, night three operation? Yes. Night three was a, a very big operation. Uh, we tried to stuff it full of tasks for the student students. Um, I don't know... I don't really know quick. We'll do... Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, so we had the students spend a lot of time self-teaching on the quick set smart key camera uh, before the operation. But anyway, so night three, big night, lots uh -huh. of um, obstacles. Yeah, go ahead. So let's just do a short walk through the operation. Um, we wanted, again, an experience that we kind of had a night one, night two, night three, and we wanted the experience to progress. Not necessarily for the experience to get harder, um, but for something new to change for them on each night. Um, some of the locks were pretty difficult on the third night. Uh, some of the doors were pretty tricky. Um, but in our pretend land, um, we also told the students, hey, if we're talking about our fictitious world here, you have been in this scenario the first night. You have been in this scenario again the next night. I mean, a facility. You've been in the facility two nights in a row. So you don't have to pretend you've never been here before. Like, you know what you're looking for. Um, so we did very minimal keeping them on rails. Um, a lot of it was open world. They can do what they wanted, when they wanted, where they wanted. Uh, but some of the mission requirements were still covert, still not doing anything destructive. Um, and we wanted them because the we tied key generation in with the covert operations, which I don't know if we will or won't do that again. Um, we might, we might do some restructuring of courses. We can talk about that at the end, but we wanted students to start with pulling the bidding from a lock. So you walk up to the lock, you don't have a key. You don't even need to necessarily pick it. Um, but try to figure out the shape or the pattern or the signature of that lock, call it in on a radio. And then a professional key would be punched and cut and attached to a drone, and that drone would fly to you and deliver you a key. So we tried that a couple times. Um, uh, we got through the front door. They went into the facility. It was very active. We had our host protective ops um, in the facility with us as a as a uh, watcher or onlooker. Um, we had our camera guy in there, 517 Media from Instagram, was in there uh, filming the whole time. He did a great job. Uh, you had two students doing the operations. You had me and Dave in there watching, and we had Arrow. So 
on the second night when Dave and I did a walkthrough to grab some uh, audio footage for some ASMR lock picking, um, I left Arrow in the car and I said, oh, I'm not going to want to hear Arrow clonking around with her nails tip tapping on the tile. Like, I don't want to have to hear her like chain jingling around her neck. So I left her in the car. The third night was a very active, um, very dark, very busy operation like looking down long hallways and seeing shadowy figures moving around, being like awkward and quiet and whispering. And one of Arrow's jobs is to tell me, hey, something's weird over there. Woof. Um, And I was very quiet with Arrow, and I told her, shh, quiet. And I moved very slow and very cautiously. And what do you know? Arrow was very quiet, and she moved very slow and very cautiously. Um, and there were times in this dark building with dark figures going into, into and out of dark rooms in just a silhouette. Like, you know, almost, almost every dog owner in the country knows that when the lights are off and a strange silhouette walks into the room, the dog's going to bark. Even if it's not an attack dog, it's just what dogs do. So there were times on the third night, I don't know if you remember, I would put Arrow in the corner in a large dark room and I would tell her to stay in her place and to be quiet. And I would, I would fucking lose her. I'd be like, shit, where'd she go? (laughs) Um, and she'd just sit there in the shadows, completely immobile. She wouldn't move. She wouldn't bark. Um, so, man, just an insane testament. Really hard to argue with results with those Fortress K9 dogs. Um, just really made my heart happy to see that she 100% was in lock and step with me and what I wanted her to do. It was just a lot of fun. I know that's a segue, um, but it made me really happy. Yeah, and I mean the whole week just seeing Arrow stay in, stay in her place during the TLP course, seeing her be so good in public, seeing how responsive she was to commands like "leave it," I was just super cool to see a working dog that fine tuned. Uh, so I really enjoyed hanging out with Arrow and picking your brain about all the principles and philosophy around the dog training too. It really tickles my brain to think about that and hear about that. But anyways. Um, Back to the advanced course, but yeah, I was super impressed with Arrow. Um, so just some concepts into how we teach. We quote-unquote booby-trapped some doors. The way we did this, though, is we gave students one booby trap that they could have reconned. Let me back it up a way. step before that, because we briefed them on that, too. Yes. So it wasn't just we gave them a booby trap. Um, what we don't want to do is set our students up for failure. Um, so we briefed them, hey... Tonight's different. You need to go slower. Um, And there's intel that says there will probably be booby traps behind some doors. So you need to be getting as much intel as humanly possible before you put your hands on any locked obstacles. So we told them that once or twice or three times. Um, We told them that more than once. Um, A lot of the offices were in a hallway, left and right of the hallway. And some of those backed up with big, large, double door, glass, like floor to ceiling doors that could see into almost every office. So um, there was a row of offices where on one side it was just doors and drywall. On the opposite side, so basically the backs of every office were large glass doors that you can see all the way in. We tried to tell the students, hey, um, those doors are considered, quote, welded shut. Like the doors, you just can't pick them. You can't open the glass doors. They're still there. They're still glass doors, but you guys can't like access them with your lock picking tools or your key cutting tools. So all this comes into play. We told them there's going to be booby traps. We told them to get as much Intel about the inside of the room before they go into the room. We told them that the back doors still existed, but that they were like permanently secured shut and not to be opened. So we knew that there was a chance that the students would take that incorrectly. And they would think that those doors are just, they just don't exist anymore. Um, And it's not the fault of them. It's not that they didn't understand it, right? It's that I knew that if I was being briefed with that, I would consider the same thing. I'd be like, okay, we can't open those. They're gone. Um, We wanted the students to look through those doors to see into the office before they, like to go around the back, look through the glass doors, then go back to the front and do the lock picking was what we were hoping. Didn't happen. And both students, I think, said, oh, we just thought they were off limits. And cool, fine, no problem. If they would have used those back glass doors, um, they would have seen into the room and saw that there was a soft booby trap, like a booby trap with no consequence, like a, think of it like, you know, knocking a broom over that's leaning against the door. 
which is basically if you don't put it back right, um, someone knows you were there. So something soft, not a big deal. Um, then we had, so we gave them the chance to look through the back glass window. Um, either we didn't explain it well enough or loud enough, um, or the students just played a different pretend game in their head than we did, which happens a lot and is nobody's fault. So we tried to give them the option of seeing the booby trap from the glass doors and then finding soft booby trap. And then knowing on the next room, oh, there might be another booby trap. So we wanted to kind of build that level for them. They did find yeah. one booby trap. They saw it was a soft booby trap. And then later, um, I think on them, uh, it's a booby trap that was completely seeable if they looked and they didn't look. And it was a, uh, a booby trap with consequences. So that was exciting uh, for everybody. What's cool, though, is one of our students had real search techniques that he taught our, our other student to find certain types of booby traps that are real world. So mm -hmm. that was a cool learning, but that was it seemed to be focused on one particular type of threat. Uh, so it was cool. There was lots of awesome thought processes. They were checking for certain things. However... Like you said, it was the same booby trap twice, just one didn't have a consequence, one did. The students ac actually did run into the low consequence one already. So, yeah, that was cool. But what we were saying from principals is we didn't set the students up for failure. We briefed them on it. We gave them a way to see it. Uh, we gave them a less consequential ver version of it. And we're not even criticizing them really for hitting the one that had a consequence, but more just illuminating how we hope our teaching style is. And again, when they hit it, it wasn't, oh, you know, ha ha. Yeah, gotcha. got, yeah, like that, like that wasn't the attitude. You know, I, I think everyone kind of had a little fun with it because it was alarming, uh, but everyone had fun with it, but it wasn't like a really cool base thing. Uh, so, but yeah, that's kind of an insight. Oh, and I thought of what we did during the day too. That's also when we did the keyboarding demo, uh, with the liquid keys. Oh, uh, yeah. we, uh, saw that, 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 that wasn't magic. I think yours worked. Mine, uh, did it. Mine got caught in the throat of the clamshell and didn't make it that. all the way down. Yeah. Which happens sometimes. So we talked a lot about our data set of these different types of techniques for how often we can actually expect them uh, to pan out. But anyways, back into the operation. So we mentioned the smart key camera that came into play. Uh, what was cool is the doors, uh, kind of, it kind of forces to install the keyway, quote unquote, upside down with the pins on the bottom instead, instead of the top, which was different than how the students practiced. So that had some cool application and nuance. Uh, one of our students, super smart, went to cut his key and file his key with a hand file in the field over a trash can in a room that, that had no windows. And it was a bit shielded from the rest of the facility. So that was super cool, super impressive, uh, super cool real world application. Eventually did get a working key. And... Uh, they had to exfiltrate something or someone perhaps and get it to an escape vehicle. Again, uh, one, one of the students, super smart, thought to secure the escape vehicle as the very first thing in the operation instead of doing it at the end. We, we were not expecting that, so that was super cool. And yeah, anything else on the recap of that operation? Oh, uh, there was a room, which, again, not intentionally for us. The under door tool was just very difficult to get it to actually work correctly because the handle did not unlock. If, if you pulled it, it just stayed locked. But you, you could open the door if you reached under and pulled it, but you couldn't just pop the lock open. So the handle had to be pulled almost entirely down to 6 o'clock before it would work. So for the under the door tool to grab that and pull it all the way down to six o'clock was pretty hard. Uh, that was a lot of time with the students. Uh, so that was another cool thing. Uh, the uh, students kind of struggle with that, but that's not a bad thing at all. 
Uh, but let's see. And yeah, just we've said it a few times, but 517 Media was a superstar the whole time. Uh, but yeah, anything else you got on that last operation recap? Uh, did you mention that? Yeah, successful key at the end, cut in the field. Yeah, I think I heard. Yeah, you say that. which with with the super cool application of going to a trash can enclosed room over a trash can that was brilliant. Um, yeah, so got a working key from a camera that goes within the keyway. That was awesome. They finished the mission. <laughs> So, so since this is an after action debrief, um, after each of these operations, we did an on scene debriefing um, with the operators. Um, and there's a, a right and a wrong way to do that. And there's not only one right way, but there are ways that are right and ways that are wrong. Um, I'm very thankful that I've had some actual professional training in that field and some pr- very professional real life experience in that field. And I've seen both positive and negative experiences of a debrief. And when done correctly, they can seriously help to crystallize a learning experience in your brain versus when they're done wrong and it just makes life worse. So uh, some of the things that we try to do on these post event debriefs were number one, we do it as soon as practicable, like the like the event's over, okay, go to the bathroom, get some water, let's do a debrief. So the job of a debriefer, and I know we've done at least one episode on this, but I'd be happy to do it again since this stuff is fresh in our brain from the operations, but some of the jobs of the debriefer, if you're going to select just one person to do it, um, you can have a group that's good at it do it on their own, but um, if you have someone who's doing the debriefing, you have a couple jobs. Number one, your job is not to debrief every single thing to death. Uh, There might be a time for that, but usually it's not in your post-event debrief in the field. So your job is to keep the momentum of the briefing moving. Another job is to not let students um, or instructors or whoever get caught in the loop. So if something is explained and then a counter comment is made and it's explained again and a counter comment is made again, you move on. Um, You have to stop that from happening. So a lot of times you have to be the, quote, bad guy. You have to be like, I know this is important to you. I know you want an answer. I know that you disagree. I know that they disagree. That's good. Um, And you should be putting a pin in things often. Um, And if you get bonus points, you should write down what those pins are so you can come back to them in the future, but um, not during that debriefing. So your job is to keep it moving, which I'm having a hard time with right now. Another one of your jobs is... uh, if you're doing an operational debrief, it really helps to keep things in a chronological um, order. So the cool thing about this is really unique where if you ask the students to do a debrief and you say, "Who's what did you do when you first walked up to the door? You know, where were you at in the stack? What was the first tool you used? Um, students kind of like stutter step and they go, uh, I don't know. And that's okay. Um, if you're doing a debrief with the intention of bringing knowledge to everybody, you have to you have to allow an open forum, and you can't punish people um, for giving honest feedback or honest answers. So if the honest answer is "I don't know," then you saying "That's unacceptable" isn't helping. You saying "That's okay. We're going to keep moving forward. Try to catch your place, um, and then once you have that answer, you know, let us know." So your job is to create an open forum for sharing information, not open like no rules, but open as in approachable. So we did this with the operators and we tried a couple things we, and we briefed each other and said, mission one, do a chronological in order recap of what happened. Number two, um, talk about learning objectives. And this doesn't mean like a standard corporate, what could we have done better? Like to force an answer from the students. Well, I don't know. I think it was great. Yeah. What he said, that's not, that's not valuable. Uh, learning objectives are things like, Hey, you know, when I was using this tool, I realized I had a better tool, but it was farther away. So I had to make this the decision of keep trying with the not good tool, but I'm here, or walk away and get the better tool. And I decided this over that. That's value. Um, or debriefer or student-led questions like, hey, I noticed you were covert and you were both quiet. You didn't have earpieces. And I noticed you two were separated. Here's something to think about. Um, and we briefed the students and said, this is not a right or wrong answer. But the question is, how frequently... Should you be interacting with your partner and keeping them updated on your progress? So should you never leave your partner's side and always tell them what you're working on? 
Or should you just go do as much as you can, and when you can't do anything else, you go find your partner? Or is it in the middle? And again, that could be team-specific, it could be individual-specific, it could be environmentally-specific, but we ask the question during a debrief and allow the students to consider the application. So that's kind of a lessons learned. So our job is to do a chronological debrief, then we do lessons learned or lessons that could be learned. Um, and then what we did, because we're here for a course, is we talked about how we would leverage this debriefing on our next operation the next night. So our de debriefing said three parts to them. Oof, let me breathe. Cool, and that was one of my favorite parts just for my own development. It just has an instructor and just in the skill set was I had never had formal debriefing training or anything. So with the TLP courses, that doesn't really come into play as much. So I greatly enjoyed that. Um, I got to run a large part of the last one, which was really cool. Um, yeah, so I definitely learned a lot and developed a lot myself with that. So I thoroughly enjoyed that. Oh, and a uh, again, just because if I don't say it now, I'm going to forget. Another daytime activity we did during the advanced course was types of searches and got practice searching each other for tools. What contexts would you use? What searches in? How thorough would you go? How do you check pockets to not get stabbed by a needle? You know, that kind of stuff. So that was cool. Uh, I enjoyed that. Uh, but yeah, just wanted to throw that out as another daytime block that we forgot to discuss. Cool. We had a long operation that night. Um, and then we went back to the house and played some more uh, Super Mario World. Yeah. And ate about three pizzas a piece. Jeez. Yeah, so anything else on the course before we just get into general musings about things like pizza in the advanced course? Um, yeah, I'll do. So this is going to be attached to the sign up page in the future for whatever course we do next. Um, and this is mainly focused on the advanced course, although we talked about TLP. Um, so what we want to create for students is a two or three or five day experience. Um, however, our curriculum shapes out in the future. Um, we want it to be a an experience. So we don't want this to be academic in nature. We don't want you to show up, sit down at a desk, do the task and leave. We want an environment that is specific to our type of learning, meaning uh, what we do is we're laid back. We try to be approachable. Uh, we try to be always positive. We don't scream or yell at our students. Uh, we don't make fun of our students. Um, if we do, we're hoping it's because we're building a rapport. But, I mean, even that, we, we try to very, very seriously minimalize. So an open, relaxed, enjoyable, peer teaching environment where we're almost peers that are collaborating instead of your standard instructor student. We also don't wear red instructor shirts. Um, and, you know, our language is even different. So we don't say, hey, you are going to learn this block next. Usually we'll go, hey, guys, uh, if you're if you're not still on a bathroom break, let's go ahead and kind of get this next block rolling. We're just we're easygoing dudes. And our content, we hope, mirrors that. So that's the environment of the course. Um, and we try to not do PowerPoint. We try to be basically the antithesis of bureaucratic learning. We also are very consummate professionals at our craft. So because we are casual about our environment does not mean that we don't value um, high level teaching. So we try to give you as much value as possible. We try to make that value quality value. Um, and our goal really is to change lives. Um, with this skill set that you can use in an emergency. You can use to save you time, to save you money, um, or again, if you have to save a life, um, we hope that some of these things are able to help you. And it's just really fun, really unique. Again, a lot of aha moments for the students. Um, we really care about what we do. We have a passion for what we do, and we hope that you join us in some of our courses. Yeah, I mean, that about sums it up. I, I don't know if I have too much else um, to say, but... Yeah, I mean, I always learn a ton from, from the students, too, because like you said, we practice this specific craft a lot. I'm always very thankful when students have a different lens that they view things through or different experiences they've had or job roles they've had and can add that extra lens to the skill set. That's always super beneficial to me to hear about someone that's coming at it from a different angle. So just as as an instructor, too, 
like you said, I try to almost think of it as more of a collaborator than I am instructing you. You listen to what I say. It's, oh, wow, cool. Let me share you all the stuff or share with you all the stuff I've worked my ass off to learn and do and refine. But we're collaborating. So if you have some lens I've never looked at this through, awesome. Tell me more about it. I want to hear it. Let's collaborate and discuss. So I think that's huge for the type of environment that we try and facilitate. Cool. That's about an hour. Let's, uh, let's wrap up. Let's do a little bit of housekeeping. So I will probably cut and paste some more of that lock picking ASMR at the end of this episode. And we'll close it out with that. Uh, but a couple notes, number one, Easiest way to find out about our courses is go to utac.io. That's a shortcut for the website. Um, or you can type in the whole thing, uncensoredtactical.com. Backslash courses will bring you to our courses page, or you can just pull the drop down menu from the homepage. So within the next 30 days, I'd like to have our 2023 calendar up and posted and available for sale. Um, we might get some other surprises throughout the year, but we're looking at teaching this advanced lock picking course maybe once maybe twice next year. Well, definitely once, maybe twice. Um, and as of now, I really like having only two students in the course. The most that I think we would do is four for the advanced course. For a standard tactical lock picking course, which is really, really, really valuable, um, even for people that are already experienced in that realm, um, our standard tactical lock picking course for two days, I think we'll teach maybe three times next year, maybe four. So we'll have the calendar up soon. If you guys want a high quality protection dog like Arrow here, um, get in touch with me. Shoot me an email at pat at utac.io. And another really big deal, um, I got to do some Patreon shout outs on the very next show. Um, that's a big deal. And I used to say uh, for less than half of a cup of coffee once a month, you can help us keep the lights on and literally help us publish the show. Uh, it's free to listen to, uh, but it costs quite a bit of money behind the scenes. Uh, I went on a road trip to go teach this course and I bought a Starbucks coffee and I was, I usually don't look at my receipts for food. I just pay for food. It was fucking $6 for a simple like coffee. And I thought, Oh shit, the $2 level on Patreon is a third of a cup of coffee, uh, once a month. So if you guys would like to share a coffee with us to help us keep the lights on, we would really appreciate that. Also Patreons above the $2 level, um, all get access to our after show, which we're going to move into very shortly. Um, what else are we missing? That's it. I mean, the Patreon really keeps this thing afloat, um, and we really appreciate everyone's support. And the content of our after show, if you're unfamiliar, is not super secret magical techniques that we share with people. The content of our after show is usually our worst content, where we just goof off and don't talk about anything important. Sometimes they're deep conversations, but they are not necessarily secrets of lockpicking or covert entry or shooting. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to press stop on the recording. Um, Y'all are going to hear some more lockpicking uh, audio that we shot in our last course. And uh, we'll see all of you on the next one. We'll see some of you in the after show. Thanks for coming, Dave.